Hello everyone, thank you for joining the beta break this month about birds. And I already introduced them, but Judy Shamoon Baranus, Bart Nolet and Wouter Versteeland are going to tell us all about birds. If you in the public want to ask a question, just raise your hands and we'll come up with a microphone so you can ask your questions. Um, oh, I hope you enjoy it. And so uh, we're beginning with the introduction. So Judy, I'd like to know about you. What is your favorite bird? Okay, sorry about that. So, yeah, one of my favorite birds, uh, for, I think for many of us, it's often a bird you do research on, so it's a bird you know quite well. For me, it started with the white stork, which is a beautiful, most of you probably know it as a bird that brings babies home, but it's a lot more interesting than that. It's a gorgeous bird, very majestic, and a great soaring migrant. One of my personal favorites. Bart, what's your favorite one? <laughs> well, I, I, well, actually, this was a very tricky question, uh, and I had to think about it hard because I have so many favorite birds. Um, but um, yeah, obviously, I, I chose one I do a lot of research on, which is the Buick Swan. And the reason why it's a favorite bird of me is that it's, it's in Dutch, it's called Kleine Swan, so it's a little swan. But in fact, it's a big, long-distance migrant. So if you look at Long distance migrants is really a big one. So if you know how that works, uh, you know a lot about the limits of uh, migration. So that's why it's my favorite bird. Thank you. And of course, for Wouter, what's your favorite one? Well, I love all birds equally, but um, I'll also go for the, the one, uh, the, the research bird, of course, which is the honey buzzard. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, that it's the species that kind of pulled me into migration research in the first place. Um, mainly while monitoring raptor migration at the eastern Black Sea coast in uh, Georgia. We see about a million uh, raptors migrating past every year, including about uh, half a million honey buzzards. And that was such a great spectacle um, that it pulled me into raptor migration research, basically. Hey, thank you. So you already said it, that that was your motivation to actually work on bird research, but how did you start? Um, so how did I start research on, on birds? I've always been personally fascinated with birds since I was small, especially with avian flight. I find it one of the things that's really most inspiring nature. Um, and then I did my studies in Israel. And Israel is one of the most spectacular places for visual migration. So birds that migrate during the day, especially large soaring migrants, you can actually see it very nicely. You can watch them migrating overhead, thousands, tens of thousands of birds at the same time. Um, and I think that's when I first really got studied, during my bachelor program. I heard a lot about migration. We went out and actually watched it. We count my, counted migratory birds. And that was the first time I really started getting involved in research. Hey, thank you. Uh, you mentioned Israel, but I believe the Netherlands is also very important for bird research. Uh, Bart, can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's, that's indeed the case. Uh, and I think that's mainly due to the fact that a lot of birds pass through the Netherlands uh, or stay in the Netherlands in the wintertime. So we tend to think of migratory birds that go from uh, Africa and, and summer in the Netherlands, but a lot of birds actually do it the other way uh, so they actually start from the Netherlands and then go to the north. So in the wintertime, there are a lot of birds in the Netherlands. There's a huge concentration of water birds, for instance. Really, uh, say, between five and six million water birds are wintering in the Netherlands. So really big concentrations. And obviously, there, a lot of people got interested in it and started research. Uh, on that uh, topic, I think the Netherlands is uh, also just a great country for ornithology and bird migration research in uh, in general, which is my I migrated here from Belgium, which is not such a spectacular distance as the birds, but it was still worthwhile. So the Netherlands is an important position also in bird research. Yeah, really great to know. But um, 
what exactly do we what exactly is migration in birds <laughs> well the definition of migration is uh, a, a periodic movement very often associated with seasons so birds move in a more or less predictable uh, direction from one season to the other it can be very long distance migrations like the arctic turns they really go from the north to south pole they're really uh, traveling the whole globe but it can also be a short distance migration for instance birds that uh, uh, breed on top of a mountain and go to the valley in the in the winter time that's also migration so um judy um because you do also do a lot of research with the birds and their um especially tracking them the a bit can you tell us But you said uh, some of the birds migrate, well, very long distances, like the Arctic Cairn, and some of them just move up and about. But why exactly do they migrate? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. No, it's not, it's not a difficult question. I think, um, for the most part, there are different reasons for different species. For the most part, we consider that birds mainly migrate uh, to follow their resources. So some birds specialize on certain food types. So, for example, if you consider the swifts and the swallows, that we see here in the summer, they're specialists on small flying insects. And those insects aren't here in the winter. So, and that's the only thing they eat. So they have to migrate to follow their food. Other birds are less specialized, but in fact, Bart already mentioned the geese. These birds move and follow, track very different types of resources. So a lot of times if their food isn't available, they specialize on certain resources, they have to follow them and they have to move after them. Yeah, it's really, if you uh, make a model out of it, um, as soon as you have seasonal fluctuation in resources, um, these models predict that migration will evolve. Um, when, for instance, in the summertime, it's better to be in one area, but that particular area is worse in the wintertime than the other area. You will uh, tend to see migration going on. So, um, we know now that they migrate and why they migrate but um how how do they know where to go and well how to do so is it um yeah because there it could be genetically um well fixed or just uh, by by learning from their parents or what is how do they do that yeah, so that's, I think, a question that there's a, a lot of debate about. Um, I can actually show a few, if you go back one, yeah, that one. Um, so if it's, if all is well, you can see a map there on the, on the screen. Is that the case? Anyway, so there's, I mean, there's a lot of debate about this and of course the um, the basic idea for a long time has been that birds inherit some kind of migration program um, which is in the genes and that this is driving them to go to a certain place and, and in, in a certain way according to a certain schedule. Um, but what we're finding out with, uh, with tracking is that uh, strategies can be surprisingly diverse uh, within a species, within a population which suggests that there is a lot of room for stochastic events to actually influence the strategies that a young bird will learn um, and eventually repeat during its, uh, its lifetime. So it seems like, like birds either learn very specific strategies from following experienced conspecifics along the way, uh, or if it's uh, genetically determined, these are rather simple strategies to fly in a certain direction for a certain amount of time, but during which the birds are very subject to environmental influences. So for example, um, a young honey buzzard from Finland might end up in West Africa if it encounters a lot of westward wind during its first migration. Uh, it might end up in, uh, in Kenya if it encounters a lot of eastward wind. Um, it will eventually set, uh, find uh, a non-breeding site, a wintering site there, and somehow, according to a mechanism that we don't really understand, find its way back to, uh, to Finland to breed, for example. 
So you can genetics are play play a role, but there's a lot of room for stochasticity to influence uh, migratory behavior and the development of migratory behavior. It was working before, so we really try to get it on the screen now. Still nothing? Yes. Whew. Okay, so you should be seeing a map now of Europe and Africa with red tracks and blue tracks uh, on it. Uh, this is an example of uh, a species which learns its migration routes uh, through cultural inheritance, so social learning. Um, full screen. Okay, and now go back one. Yeah, okay, so what you're seeing here is uh, tracks of lesser spotted eagles um, from Germany. Uh, the, the birds in red are experienced adults from, uh, 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 in orange, I'm sorry, experienced adults from Germany uh, that are using uh, the Eastern Mediterranean flyway. So they're, when they leave Germany, they basically head straight through the Bosporus Strait, uh, fly through Turkey, uh, through uh, Lebanon, Israel, and uh, Suez into uh, Africa, wintering in Southeast Africa. Um, the tracks in red are juveniles from the same population, and the majority of these juveniles, they actually leave Germany at the same time that the adults are departing on migration, which gives them an opportunity to follow these experienced adults into this very specific overland detour around the Mediterranean Sea. Um, which is very important because if an eagle were to attempt flying over the Mediterranean Sea, he's likely to get exhausted, to get a heart attack and, and drown. Um, they've seen this, for example, in vultures. Yeah? If they try to cross the sea, they flap their wings 90 times, they get a heart attack and they just drop out of the sky. Um, what you see in blue are birds that were translocated that year from uh, Latvia to Germany. Uh, and these juveniles actually failed to synchronize their departures with the adults from the German population. And as a result, they followed the uh, instinctively uh, migrated southward, uh, causing them to get stuck uh, at the Mediterranean coast. Uh, they, the e these eagles know that flying over the sea is dangerous, so they don't even dare to, to try it. Uh, and eventually these birds just end up spending weeks flying up along the coast looking for a crossing, but they can't, uh, so eventually they die and they never make it to Africa. So this is a bird that really depends on social learning uh, to find these very specific migration routes. Um, and if we then look at my favorite bird, the honey buzzard, um, these are juveniles from Finland, and what you see here are uh, tracks of these juvenile honey buzzards on their first autumn migration. Um, colored according to the wind conditions that they encountered along the way. So red tracks, when, when the red colors indicate winds blowing towards the east, uh, blue colors indicate uh, situations where birds encounter winds blowing to the west. So you can see there's a clear association between the direction that the birds are flying and the wind direction. So these juveniles, they have a simple, they don't, they don't have the opportunity to follow adults because they leave two weeks later than the adults. So they're just heading southward, uh, following a simple innate program, and the wind conditions that they encounter along the way determine where they end up in Africa. Um, and eventually this causes these different individuals to learn different, very different migration routes across their lifetime, so that honey buzzards from Finland can actually end up using uh, a flyway across the Strait of Gibraltar, but they can equally uh, learn a migration flyway uh, through uh, Israel or uh, via Tunisia uh, into Italy and, and, uh, and back to Finland. So there's quite a bit of variation in uh, how migration strategies develop between species. Okay, and is there a difference between 
uh, species that migrate south in the sum uh, that migrate to Africa in the summer, or species that we have as winter guests? Because Bart, you are doing lots of research on Arctic birds. Do you see they behaving the same way as birds going to Africa? Um, I think well, the basic principles are the same, um, but maybe the groups of species are different, and ev every group of species has different uh, cues that they use to learn the migration, like. What was saying uh, of this particular bird of prey that was using social information. A lot of goose and swan species use social information also. They, they actually travel in family groups. And that's hardly the case with uh, passerines. They, they all go by their own. So they really have a more, much more a genetic program that uh, directs them. Uh, and a lot of those birds are going to Africa. You want to react on that? Um, no, I think if you consider whether you're talking about birds that over that will actually migrate and spend the winter here or birds that will spend the winter in Africa you also see that they also respond sometimes to different cues so birds there are arctic bird the arctic birds are quite sensitive to snow melt and and environment different environmental conditions in the birds that are going to be spending the summer here for example that are reacting to different very different environmental cues that they're exposed to so we see a lot of these factors may differ um, whether or not they migrate over land or over sea, for example, these kind of strategies will, de will depend not necessarily on whether they're spending the winter here or the summer here, but more on their morphology, what type of flight behavior they have. That's something that will influence where and how they migrate, their strategies. Yeah, maybe we could show um, this one, which is, uh, these are uh, white fronted geese that we tracked from the Netherlands, which are the red dots. I'm not sure we can see, it's maybe a bit small, but... And then the orange ones, uh, which are from Hungary. And um, you see the snow uh, disappearing in the springtime. So like Judy was saying, this is a very important phenomenon, of course, that determines when to migrate, at least. Uh, and you see the, the, the Dutch birds, the red dots, really follow this snow melt. Whereas the uh, Hungarian ones, they actually go straight east to uh, northern Kazakhstan. And they... they, they um, then fuel up there because they really have to fuel like it's like a Formula One race that you make have to make pit stops to do this migration and uh, there the Hungarian birds are going just in one straight l travel up north very rapidly so they have a very different strategy than the Dutch birds that follow gradually follow the snow melt um, and that's totally due to the very different environment that they have to cross so if within this species, you can find very different migration strategies. Yes. I know that a couple of hundred years ago in the Netherlands, it was common belief that geese uh, came out of cockles because they just left for the summer and then they came back really weirdly. But now we have modern technology and we migrated up north. I believe it was uh, barons who actually saw them breeding in uh, Nova Zemla and Spitsbergen. But, um, Wouter, I believe uh, you said during our first conversation that uh, right now we have actually have the same questions about bird migrating as 50 years ago, but what are these questions and can't they be solved with modern technology we have right now? Yeah, I think we're just becoming able to answer those questions thanks to modern technology. So the, the, there has been a lot of theorizing about where do birds go, um, what routes do they follow? How do they learn those routes? But we've never actually been able to to track birds across these entire journeys. Um, so it's only now that we're actually starting to to get to grips with some of these uh, questions that have been, uh, um, yeah, very big questions in ornithology for a very long time. Yeah. And yeah, oh. I was just wondering whether we could show some of the techniques that uh, that we are using. Like, yes, I mean, we're talking uh, about techniques now. Yes, because uh, we actually... And we have a small uh, uh, video. <laughs> oh, it's going to work. <laughs> Let's see. Yes, um, because uh, we actually want to talk about uh, modern technology used uh, by the UFA, of course. So, yeah. uh, if you have video, uh, please show us. Maybe first, oh, yeah. the yeah. first before the video... So, so, my apologies, we were a little bit, we, we were talking about different strategies that birds have, and we had a few clips that we actually wanted to share with you just to show you how diverse migration can be even within the same species, because we were talking about different strategies across different species, but something that we see from our research is that even within a species and even within a population, so birds that are breeding maybe 10 
centimeters apart from each other can have very different strategies. Um, so we have a, a few short clips that we want to show you, um, just, to show, just to share this. So Valter can ex explain a little bit about this one. Yeah, so if you want to like, see how di diverse strategies can be within a species, here we see an animation of a, a male and a female honey buzzer that have been together, happily married for several years um, in the Netherlands. And they migrate, when they migrate to Africa, they go to very different places. So they migrate independently, even though uh, from each other. They both go through the Strait of Gibraltar. But you see the male going all the way into uh, westernmost Africa, while the female makes a long stop over in Nigeria and then migrates all the way to Angola so that these birds are separated by thousands of kilometers on the wintering grounds. Um, and in addition to that, well, these different strategies can then also impact on their life histories, of course. So what we saw with this particular uh, female is that while she was migrating over the Sahara that spring, uh, she got sidetracked and was flying all over the place. Um, which with remote sensing data told us that this was due to a dust storm, that she was fleeing for a dust storm. She eventually had to stop in Mauritania, rest there for a couple of weeks to gain her strength. In the meantime, the male had already arrived in the Netherlands and as good males do, he waited for his partner a little bit, but not forever. Uh, so by the time when she got back, uh, he had another uh, partner and she failed to breed that year because of this uh, dust storm she encountered along the way. Um, there was a bit of poetic justice in the sense that the male got eaten by a goshawk that year. But um, just to give you an idea of how diverse strategies can be, these birds from, that come from the same population in the Netherlands, they, they basically disperse all over Africa uh, and they may, may use very different routes to do so. So we're now going to switch to another species, a very different one. Um, and these are lesser blackback gulls. So these are gulls that breed in the Vodden Islands on the Netherlands. And if you see these different dots, each are a different individual. And what we see is that some individuals will migrate only to the UK, about 500 kilometers away, and others are going all the way to Africa, so 5,000 kilometers away. So huge differences among individuals that spend the summer together. And as I said, they can nest very close to each other, experience the same conditions, and then imagine what their winter is like. Some of them are in the tropics, whereas others are in climates that are very similar to ours. So our tracking technology is enabling us to actually see these very, very fine differences among individuals within populations. Um, and we see this across quite a few different types of species. So from soaring migrants to gulls, we also see this in the, in the geese to a different extent, that within populations you can see a lot of variation. Um, do we want to show the geese? So we have another video to show you just how diverse this can be among different species. We'd also like to show you a short video about geese. So I'm going to try and make it run and maybe Bart can tell a bit while I'm doing the technical part. Yeah, so we um, actually want to um, couple the, the migration performance to the reproductive performance because of course uh, what you eventually want to like to do is look at fitness consequences of different uh, migration strategies to try and understand why there are differences uh, within a population. And that's why we did this study on uh, barnacle geese, which you cannot see. <laughs> Not working. Black, black. Okay. Anyway. So what we found is that uh, some geese um, migrate uh, gradually to the north with the snow melt, but others uh, go very fast and actually um, at some moment they discovered that s s s spring was... Um, it's, you can see it there? Yeah, but that's too far away. Yeah, uh, okay. Now, well, anyway... Um, what we found is that the birds, uh, in a very early spring, they have to hurry up and uh, migrate uh, very fast to arrive in time on the breeding grounds to uh, have their eggs hatching uh, at the foot peak. Um, but, and they did migrate faster than they did in, in late years. But the egg laying wasn't uh, much advanced in time. And uh, we think it's because they actually arrive on the breeding grounds if they have migrated very fast with a, 
uh, without reserves. And they have to feed on the breeding grounds to uh, make up for that. So actually they do not make a stop in between, but they have to make a stop at the end to refuel. Um, so it, it doesn't, uh, the, the, they don't uh, start breeding earlier. So that may uh, be a problem for them if uh, climate change is going on and uh, the spring starts earlier and earlier. Um, and that's because actually they don't, they cannot predict from here, from the breeding, breeding grounds, uh, from the wintering grounds, uh, so in the Netherlands, they cannot predict whether spring is early or, or late in the, in the Arctic, in the breeding areas. So they uh, have to find out uh, halfway their journey. Yes. Later, uh, we're also going to talk about how this changing world affects birds. Um, but now I actually want to know about how you track birds, because I see those um, UVA bits laying there, and of course the UVA is known for having developed these. Uh, Judy helped developing those. Um, so how do, what are, is special about these trackers, and why did you decide to develop them? So um, maybe first uh, to explain why we decided to develop them. The, of course, our university isn't the only university developing tags. There are a lot of organizations that develop this type of different types of technology. But at some point we had realized that the technology that was out there wasn't suitable enough for what we really wanted to do. So we had a lot of demands and what we wanted to try and measure in the field. We were really interested in measuring high resolution uh, measurements of flight behavior, for example. We wanted some more flexibility. A lot of times when you order a tag from a company, in the past at least, when we first got started, you would get a preset system and you couldn't really change much yourself. You didn't have much flexibility as a researcher. So one of our first demands was to create something that we could really play with, that we could really experiment with. So we would have virtual experiments, basically. And I think one of the most exciting things for me as a biologist is that I work in an institute where we have different expertise here. So we were able to work together with the technology center downstairs and to develop really fantastic new technology. So we could come to them with our requirements, with our requests, and find out whether it was even technically feasible. So we have some examples on the, on the desk, um, and we can hand them around if you guys want to take a look. But basically our GPS tags have a lot of things that you have in your phone. They have a GPS um, receiver, so we use GPS technology to measure where the birds are, how fast they fly, how high they fly, their location throughout the entire year, regardless of the environment that they're in. We also have a small accelerometer on board, so it's also what you use in your phone to auto-rotate your uh, screen, for example, or to measure how many steps you take in a day. We can use that to measure behavior and measure that remotely. Um, other things, we have a solar panel, we have to keep these uh, loggers as light as possible to put on birds, so we want to keep the weight down, but measure all year round. So we have a small battery, which is recharged with solar, solar panels. We also have to transmit our data. So there's a lot of, I mean, I can go on and on, but there's a lot, a lot of technology in these, in these tags. The tags have different weights, depending on the birds that we're going to measure. So we have a huge one on the table. It's obviously not for a small uh, songbird, but something we use for a vulture. For a vulture, for example, if we put a tag that's too small on it, can just crush it and destroy it. So we also have to put something stable enough that this bird isn't going to actually destroy uh, the first time it picks on its tag. Um, so that's basically how we got started here, 2008. And since then, we have projects basically all around the world um, with a lot of different types of species and constantly trying to develop the technology that we have. Um, yeah, maybe one thing to show you to explain how we use ex accelerometers, right? So these um, measure acceleration in three axes. And in this, in this picture above, um, you can see examples of different types of behavior. So you can see the signals that we measure in three axes. And from this, we can actually extract behavior. So we can determine whether a bird is, for example, standing still, whether it's sitting, whether it's flapping its wings and how fast it's flapping its wings. Um, whether it's floating on the water or soaring, for example, or even whether it's picking uh, prey, whether it's finding food. Um, and I hope everyone can see this video just to give you a real feeling for what this, is, what this is like. You'll see a video of this bird basically standing still. First it's walking and you can see the signal um, fluctuates a bit, then it stands still, and then you see it taking off. So you can see this huge fluctuation in the data. And this is information that we can use to then extract behavior from this data. So, run it. Is the film working? Okay.
So here, basically what we do is to calibrate these sensors, we also take videos live, we use observations, and then we can link these to the signals that we measure, and we use um, techniques developed by artificial intelligence, machine learning, to then automatically annotate our, uh, all our data. You can imagine that we have millions and millions of records, we can't go and do them all by hand, so we really need good techniques to do this in an automated way. All right. Um, but Bouter, you also tracked many bits in your investigations, but uh, we heard you use mainly those old GPS tracks and not the high-tech things developed by the UFIRE itself. Why did you use those? Sounds so disrespectful if you say it that way. Um, yeah, so uh, as, as for the, the research questions that I had at that time, uh, I think the GPS uh, in itself already provided a huge amount of information we never had access to uh, before uh, when I started. So uh, for my PhD research here at the UVA, uh, I looked mainly into how these honey buzzards, these soaring migrants, they basically use solar power and wind power to, to fuel their migration. So I wanted to know how they use weather conditions on migration. And uh, you can use uh, weather mo global weather models for that, uh, but these come at a resolution of a few hours and, and a spatial resolution of a few kilometers. Um, so, if also to match the resolution of the behavior and the, and the environment, it made more, this kind of GPS information was already sufficient. Um, and then, on the other hand, uh, in the last uh, few years, I've been focusing mainly on uh, trying to figure out how young birds learn to migrate. But the thing with young migrants is that there's a chance of 70% or more you'll never see them back again uh, once you deploy a tracker on them. Uh, because they're inexperienced, um, naive birds that are just likely to die on their first migration. So if you want to get any information back from those birds at all, you need to have trackers with remote uh, data transmission capabilities. So that those are, for example, satellite transmitters. Um, but then to communicate with a satellite, you need a lot of uh, battery power. Um, so you basically end up with a trade-off uh, between what you can do with a single tracker. Um, and that's why I've been, uh, so for studying the juvenile birds, I, uh, using satellite transmitters uh, is the most sensible things to do, but uh, these rarely come with additional measuring capabilities uh, such as accelerometers and, and, and whatnot. All right. Um, well, you already spoke about how it can be improved, but you also told uh, us about the Internet of Animals. <laughs> can you tell us something about that? Yeah, so that's kind of the... As we are putting more and more sensors into these trackers, the idea is that we can uh, actually um, use these birds as sentinels to measure environmental conditions across the globe. Uh, I think the, the first real, really big example of that... Uh, or there, there's actually a few that have been going on at the same time, but for example, people have been putting uh, sensors in uh, GPS tags on pigeons to measure air quality, because there's a lot to do with fine dust in the atmosphere, uh, etc. Um, in South America, uh, they are using vultures to locate illegal dump sites, uh, because vultures like to scavenge, uh, so they're like spies in the air telling the government where people are dumping trash uh, that they shouldn't be doing. Um, a recent one is with albatrosses, uh, so there's a, a lot of illegal fishing uh, activity in, uh, across the world's oceans, mainly by uh, the, uh, the Chinese uh, fishing fleet. But all these fishing vessels have radar on them, so what they've actually done is equipped uh, trackers with uh, a sensor that can pick up radar signals and they can actually um, see when an albatross is flying behind the shipping vessel. And they, can, and they know uh, the legal fishing activities that are going on, but they also see a lot of albatrosses following shipping vessels that are not supposed to be there. So these albatrosses are basically spying on illegal uh, fishing activities in the ocean. So the idea of the Internet of Animals is that um, uh, as the, the more and more birds are being tracked and more sensors can be integrated in these trackers, these birds can help us collect a lot of information about what's going on um, in the world, actually. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I think we have a question from the public.
Um, these techniques are very incredible, but are, isn't it very dangerous for these birds? Aren't people going to hunt them down because they sell kind of these inf this information? Yeah, so <laughs> what's actually interesting is that now this idea of the Internet of Animals is, is coming up now and it, it, in a way it sort of legitimizes some of the weird stuff that has been going on in the past. Um, so for example, um, uh, vultures from Israel with GPS trackers have been uh, kidnapped by Egyptian uh, policemen because uh, being accused of spying on, that being used by Mossad to spy on activities in uh, Egypt, that sort of thing, you know. So yeah, I, I guess the, the military is always uh, thinking uh, about these kind of weird applications before we mere ecologists start to think about them. Um, but when it comes about the birds themselves, obviously we want to, uh, we don't want the birds to behave in an unnatural way. So there's also quite a lot of guidelines on how much weight you can put on a bird, uh, how, what kind of um, harnesses you can use, because you can, you can uh, equip a bird with a tracker as kind of a backpack that it carries around, around the wing. Um, but this is, for example, very bad for seabirds, because the, the harness um, disrupts the plumage. And they really need a perfectly closed plumage when they're diving in the sea not to get um, hypothermia. Um, so the only way that you can then track those birds is, for example, by attaching the tracker to the tail or to the leg or something like that. So there's always a lot of... Um, and, and, and people will also uh, try out different techniques on birds in captivity before they are being applied to free-flying birds in the, in the wild. Um, and yeah, in general, I think that uh, a lot of uh, ecologists are, we're, we're animal lovers, right? We're, we're doing this out of sheer, sheer curiosity of trying to understand the world from a bird's perspective. And, and, and we have an innate sort of respect for these birds. Um, and we do our hardest to, to use the technology in as responsible a way as, uh, as possible, which doesn't mean that it doesn't go wrong sometimes. Uh, but then we need to learn our lessons and also uh, communicate about those kind of uh, negative effects uh, on, uh, on birds. Mm. Hi, thank you. I think that was a really good answer to uh, that question. But uh, we talked about a bit of uh, experimental research in uh, captivity. And Bart, that's basically what you were doing at uh, the NEO, the Dutch uh, Research Center for Ecology. But you're also working at the UFANO, um you know, for the tracking expertise. So uh, can you tell us a bit uh, about how you combine tracking and experimental research? Yes, these, um, the measurements that we do, um, well, we like to know a lot, of course, of the birds uh, out in the field, the free uh, living birds, but some things you simply cannot measure on these birds. Like uh, Judy showed, you can uh, have an estimate of the behavior remotely from these uh, accelerometers, but there are other things you, you simply cannot measure. Um, like, for instance, the food intake rate is something which we would like to know, or um, how heavy they are. Um, so uh, these are the kind of informations. We now try to, um, to determine uh, partly in captive birds. So we do measurements uh, in birds in captivity, uh, for instance, uh, on intake rate uh, at different food densities. Uh, we can manipulate the food densities uh, in, in the lab, of course, and then measure the food intake rate. And if you measure then food density out in the field, you have at least an estimate of food intake rate of free living birds. So these are the kind of things we do uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the NEO. Um, and also, like uh, Wouter was saying, uh, just simply uh, trying out uh, different uh, attachment techniques for your devices that you can really try that out on uh, captive birds first before you apply them uh, on free-living birds that just fly away and you can never catch them again to uh, take your device off again. So in our uh, first conversation you were also telling us that um, there's now more, um, more research going on in um, actually tracking, but you're thinking we should go back to more observational and experimental research. Is that... Uh, well, it's, uh, if you uh, read about the history of ornithology, then of course people started uh, putting rings on the birds uh, more than 100 years ago, only, I would say. But then uh, they were interested in where are these birds going. Um, and of course the birds had to die uh, some, some other place. And, and, but that gave a first indication of the distances that birds were 
were um, moving and, and where they were ending up. But very soon afterwards, so around 1910 already, so more than 100 years ago also, people were starting doing experiments. So translocating ringed birds from one island to the other and see whether uh, these birds would find their way uh, still. Um, and now we are in the face uh, that we have these fantastic devices. People are doing a lot of observational research uh, uh, nowadays, so just mapping where birds are going. Um, but there's a, a, a large need for more experimental work, and I think Wouter sh already showed one very nice example in which uh, uh, birds were translocated from one area to the other and then see how the juveniles were behaving. Um, so really, um, if you want to know something about cause and effect, you, you need experiments, and uh, we are really at the stage now that we uh, should try to do that more. And it's now becoming possible because these devices are becoming cheaper. So you mean if for an experiment you need, you need uh, of course, a, a decent sample size. Um, and um, so now we're at the stage that we can start doing that. There's, for instance, a, a classical experiment in which uh, an old colleague of mine uh, 50 years ago translocated a lot of starlings from the Netherlands to uh, Switzerland, both juveniles and adults, because he was interested in how the juveniles learn their migration, similar to what Wouter was saying. But this was just with rings, so really huge numbers. And what he found was that the adults, this is pear deck, what he found was that the adults are um, actually finding their original wintering site, which is in the south of England uh, and in Brittany, so to the southwest of the Netherlands. Um, the adults f uh, released in Switzerland, they did find that wintering area, but the juveniles, they went southwest, just following their genetic program, and they ended up in northern Spain. Um, and we really would like to repeat that experiment now with uh, these uh, fantastic devices and see exactly how these migrations are being performed. So that's the way we are going at the moment. So um, then, Judy, you also work as a vice chair of NRAM, um, and you do a lot. Um, you work a lot with uh, radar images to track birds. Um, so we were wondering how how does that work? Uh, the, how do you even visualize or uh, yeah see birds on the radar? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think a lot of people don't realize that tools that we have that are used for common day practice. So the for example, the radar that you use to measure whether or not it's going to rain, we call it in Dutch Bauer radar, not only measures rain, but it measures birds almost just as well or even better sometimes than it measures rain particles. So basically it, it picks up reflectivity in the air, it can be due to dust particles, pollen, insects, water, and birds are very large water particles, you can imagine them. Um, so when we have migration or we have large numbers of birds in the air, we can also use radar to pick up those numbers. So I have... Um, small image here and you can see one of the exciting things is that um, if you consider the meteorological institutes all over Europe so this is the picture on the map our our network was uh, 24 different countries and each of these countries have meteorological radars and we know technologically at least that all of these radars are able to pick up birds so now we actually have a network which can measure bird migration across all of Europe we were talking about our GPS technology. One of the limitations we have still is size. So we can't put GPS tags on very, very tiny birds. We have other methods that we can use, but radar can be used across the entire span of all the different masses of birds. It can even pick up large insects. The other advantage also is that we have methods that we can also estimate the numbers of birds in the air. And that's something that we cannot do with GPS. So GPS is really designed for tracking an individual, knowing what an individual does. But if you want to know how many birds are actually flying at a particular time, if you want to estimate numbers in the air, then that's something that radar is very, very good at. So, the comp so these methods are really very complementary when studying bird migration. Yeah, thank you. And um, in according to that, um, how important is, um, considering this subject, uh, international collaboration? Yeah, that's um, actually for this subject, it's almost impossible to do without inter international collaboration. So um, first of all, you need the meteorological institutes to get organized and be able to share and standardize data. So they're also working as a community. Um, once that's done, then we have an opportunity as, as ecologists to try and access that data. 
Um, so you want countries to get together to create a kind of critical mass so that you can convince a, commu a different community using a sensor for something very different. Their aim is to measure weather. For them, if they have birds in their radar, birds are actually disturbing their signal. They're actually causing noise and, and basically it's garbage in their data. So they want to throw that out and filter it out. And, that, and the information that they're throwing away is information that we want for our research. Now, if you come to um, organizations all over Europe as one person, you might not be that powerful. But if you come there as an entire community of from 24 different countries, yeah, then you have a voice and you have an opportunity to really change data sharing techniques of, of how to access data. We're even trying to change policy and what kind of data these meteorological institutes are storing so that they don't throw away information that we really need. So it's really international collaboration when you want to scale up to this level of Europe is essential. You can't do it without it. Well, and international collaboration is, is important for research, but is it also important for bird conservation? Or is bird con conservation actually a focus point in your research? So bird conservation, um, actually it's not always the focus of our research. So a lot of times the focus of our research is actually is first and foremost fundamental understanding of bird behavior, of how birds adapt to the environment, how birds adapt to change. Uh, we have different types of research questions. But once you have that knowledge, you can then use that um, towards bird, bird conservation. I think I'll let maybe Wouter and uh, Bart tell a little bit more about it. But if you consider that these birds are moving across many different countries, and if you want to do anything about conservation for migrants, then you have to co collaborate internationally. It, will, it won't be enough to just do something in the Netherlands if your birds are in the Arctic mm -hmm. in, the, in the summer and doing something very different, or if in the, in the summer they're in Africa. Right. So maybe one of you would like to add a bit yes. more about that. Yeah, so if you think about the juvenile honey buzzards that I showed before, um, within, by the end of the first migration, these birds had collectively visited more than 60 countries in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, across their entire lifetime, they collectively visited 87 different countries. That is, birds from, that have been born within a few tens of kilometers from each other in Finland. And then in Finland, the authorities are investing uh, all kinds of, well, large amounts of money into conservation programs for these birds. But then they are only there for three months of the year. And nine months of the year, they spend scattered all across Africa. Um, so if you're really concerned about uh, conserving these populations, uh, protecting these birds, um, international collaboration is the only way to go. Um, and I'm mainly concerned with migrant land birds and migration between Europe and Africa. Uh, and a major challenge there is simply building research capacity in Africa, actually. Um, so far, um, most of the work that has been done on the ground in Africa is also being done by... Uh, Western researchers going there um, and then, let's say, reaping the benefits of these spectacular phenomena that are taking place there. Um, but you can make a good argument that actually um, African researchers have, uh, should be supported in, in taking a lead on this research and taking a prominent role in this research. So one of the things that uh, is being done under uh, stimulus of the CMS, that's the Con uh, International Convention for Migratory Species, um, is actually to try and, and foster greater collaboration between uh, researchers and conservationists at a flyaway scale, because in the end you, you, you have to deal with migrant birds at a flyaway scale. Um, and you also see that this idea is being picked up more and more by, for example, the bird life uh, partners in different countries. So, for example, BirdLife Netherlands has a lot of conservation is now working on a new conservation program um, for um, Dutch or let's migrant birds breeding in the Netherlands that uh, winter in uh, the Sahel countries, uh, where they try to collaborate with local partners uh, to come up, to come up with uh, innovative ways for conserving these birds in the in the Sahel, uh, which ha is also tied in with agriculture and, and uh, securing sustainable livelihoods for, for people in the Sahel countries, actually. So when it, when it comes to conservation of migrant birds, especially the species that spread out over these huge ranges, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a problem of an epic scale, actually. 
Um, and yeah, to say that uh, international collaboration is needed is the very least you can say, actually. It, it goes well beyond that into finding new ways for birds and, and people to, to coexist in, in, in environments such as the Sahel, for example. Maybe may add something about, uh, you, you asked um, what drives our research and uh, yeah, Judy was saying it's, it's more fundamental research, it's curiosity driven. That, that's the main thing we're, that, that drives us, but um, we're also looking at how birds react to the environment and um, that, that is our main issue. And it's just the fact that the environment is changing so rapidly uh, by human actions that um, automatically you end up doing also things that uh, have a link uh, with conservation or at least understanding how humans are affecting these birds. And um, well maybe Judy you can say something about uh, your research on, on for instance uh, how windmill parks are affecting uh, flying birds. Yeah so so one of um, the things we're very interested in fundamentally is understanding flight behavior, how birds respond to their environment. And what we're finding now is that type of research is actually becoming very and very important for wind parks. So we know that there's a big transition, energy transition is a major issue in Europe, especially in the Netherlands. There's a very strong push to develop wind energy at sea, over the North Sea. And there's a lot of controversy about it. So, so we know that wind parks can be problematic. How problematic is still a big question for birds. But what we can do is at least try and understand how birds move in and around parks, whether they avoid them or not, what kind of behavior they have. So what we're trying to do now is uh, in this figure, for example, maybe this one below, this is Gemini Wind Park. This is the largest wind park in the North Sea. It's a Dutch wind park on the border with uh, German waters. Huge installation. And what we're trying to do now is actually measure birds that are breeding in a nearby colony. Nearby is 60 kilometers away. And actually to see to what extent do these birds actually interact with such a park when it's 60 kilometers offshore. How often do they go there? How often do they go to sea? What is their behavior when they're at the sea? And even try and understand their very fine scale flight behavior. So in this figure, you can see um, very high resolution measurements. The little dots um, in lines, these are the wind turbines themselves. And once birds move into the park, we can actually measure bird movement every three seconds. So we can really see whether they fly below the turbines, in between the turbines. In this case, we have a bird that was foraging for about two hours within the wind park. Um, and actually flying in between the turbines. So we can really see it flying underneath at very low altitudes. Um, and we can try and use this information to understand bird behavior and then try and understand, um, help design parks in different ways or try and help understand how we can develop different kinds of mitigation measures for different species. So these are ways that we can convert our fundamental, or at least apply some of our fundamental knowledge to try and mitigate some of these conflicts between humans and wildlife that are really increasing in the now, but we'll definitely do so in the coming years. Yes, because uh, we um, mm. well, because we already talked a bit about um, how humans and international collaboration is so important. Because um, well, is the screen changed? Well, we're just going to continue because, um, well, <laughs> there are lots of, of course, we here in the Netherlands, yes, <laughs> of course, it's Bouter, of course, with the honey buzzards, as you can see, um, but of course, yes, <laughs> but there are many different cultures around the world and birds that fly here, fly all the way to Africa, fly to South, Southern Europe, and well, there they are seen um, as more as food or as, uh, you know, proud if you can kill a um, bird of prey. So how can we work together to, you know, conserve birds? Wouter, you talked about it because your travels to Georgia and Senegal. Yeah, so, um, well, as I, uh, as I said in the beginning, my... Um, research into, into migration started in the Republic of Georgia on the east coast of the Black Sea. Uh, and there's um, what's a very popular activity for uh, young men in the rural villages there 
is to shoot raptors during migration because you have to imagine there's a million of these birds flying past, uh, flying through that bottleneck every year. Uh, so for those people, it's the most normal thing in the world and it seems like an endless stream of, of birds and meat actually, which is quite an expensive product there. So people are shooting these birds in numbers that are of concern in the sense that it's probably not sustainable. Um, so we've been working there uh, for 10 years now, um, trying to do something about this hunting problem and the way in which we've actually uh, decided to approach this issue is mainly through education and uh, of kids because we found that changing the habits of uh, people who have been hunting for a long, long time is very difficult. Um, and working with local authorities is also not really good because the police officers in those villages are the cousins of the hunters and, you know, it just, you don't get anything done. Um, so it's my conviction that in the end, if that uh, conservation issue is going to be solved, it will have to come from within those communities uh, and from young conservation, conservationists in those countries. So we've also been working on, the, um, so I, I've organized quite a few training programs for students from Georgia, Turkey, Armenia, uh, who then come together uh, in this migration hotspot uh, to try and come up with innovative solutions for this problem. Um, and by now, some of these people are working uh, in the Ministry of Environment in Georgia, for example, or in uh, uh, conservation NGOs, a new bird life partner has been started in the country. So step by step, we are coming to a point where we can change the culture. But that's, you know, changing culture takes time. It's not, uh, and a concern that I've had is that there would be a more activist branch of uh, uh, bird watchers coming to, to Georgia to cause mayhem and, and to um, yeah, basically pick a fight with the hunters, which is something that has actually happened in uh, quite a few other countries. But what you then see is that um, the conservation problem ends up in a deadlock where there's a massive conflict between hunters and uh, conservationists. Conservationists are being threatened at, um, with, with guns and, and whatnot. Um, because the hunters feel attacked in their traditions and in their cultures and in their, and in their livelihoods. Um, so when we're trying to come up with solutions for the birds, uh, I think it's inevitable that we also have to, or actually first have to come up with solutions for these people themselves on how to uh, have a sustainable livelihood which can be decoupled from uh, unsustainable harvesting of birds by hunting. And one of the ways to do that is through education, but also uh, ecotourism has been an important uh, part of our conservation work there. And we do see that, that um, as soon as people start making money off the birds, it creates a debate within those communities where people who host tourists get angry or upset with hunters because they're causing tourists to stay away and whatnot. So eventually that, those kinds of things are going to change um, the way birds are treated in those, uh, in those places. But um, to, to do it the traditional way and just to go there and say, no, we have these international rules and they are protected because we think they should be protected and that is not going to uh, lead to sustainable solutions. Mm. Yes, I think that's really nice um, to end this. But we have one uh, shooted question for you. So... We start with Bart. If you were a bird, where would you go? That's an easy one. Uh, I, would, I would go where there are no predators, there are no diseases, there's lots of food, there are mates for me, and uh, I have a very pleasant life. But where would that be then? <laughs> yeah, that's how I have to find out. By being a young bird, I follow my parents and see what they are doing, and uh, I see what the trick is. Do you all agree with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I would go to the Roaring Forties. That's uh, a belt in the, uh, in the ocean where winds are very, very strong. I would have to be an albatross. And then I just go soaring. Forget about the partners and whatever. I just soar all day long over the ocean. Look for fish once in a while. I think that's what I would do. If I've learned anything from honey buzzards, I've learned that it's best to go with the flow and see wherever it takes you. So, Well, thank you very much. And... Uh, just. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much for this uh, really exciting hour about birds. Um, yeah, so thank you all too for listening. And uh, we'll see you next month. Then we have an edition about, or uh, to Mars, to about space research. And if you're going so excited about birds or the beta break, uh, we're always looking for new members. So send in a solicitation. And see you next month. And I want a big applause for our three guests. <laughs>